Joining us again today is Pete Faulkner from DV Results. Now, Pete's got over 20 years experience working in the digital realm. He leads the delivery of innovative digital capabilities for his customers with a wealth of experience and passion. Now, Pete's helped many organisations transform their digital assets and he's accumulated his experience across all aspects of the digital solutions from the creative side all the way through to the detailed technical systems integration end of the spectrum. Now, last time we spoke with Peter about low code. This time, I want to speak to Peter about some of the real success stories in the financial services industry, which involve the next generation of digital technology with that low code. Now, Pete, I understand today you've brought along a guest to join us. Yeah, I have, yeah. So, yeah, as you said, we're building on that story from last time. So, we, last time we spoke about low code in general and, and what's happening across the board, but we wanted to make it really specific today and talk about some real examples. So I brought Richard Davies along with me from OutSystems. We work with uh, Richard at OutSystems, who are, I guess, one of the leading low-code platforms uh, globally today. And uh, consequently, there are some great success stories and real uh, takeaways that um, organisations, CIOs, uh, business leaders, et cetera, can take back to their organisation to consider, think about, as far as embracing that next, next generation. So uh, Richie and I'll talk about that today. All right, great to have on board, Richard. Now, Pete, what Thanks. trends and requirements are you seeing across the financial services that are requiring a different approach to what we've always had? Yeah, uh, well, it, it's interesting. And uh, if you look at the market at the moment, it's obviously been compressed by the challenges of COVID and working virtually. We've got closed borders, We're, through that we've got a resource shortage. But if you look at what the banks are doing, what the insurance companies are doing, wealth, super, and so on, uh, they're, they're ramping up activity. And consequently, they're running out of capacity to get work done. And it's further compressed by the fact that there's a really competitive market out there. There's lots more FinTech organizations coming on the scene and we're, well, these organisations are looking to be more agile, more responsive, and deliver more with less. But they're butting up against the problems of the old or current frameworks, which are and legacy within their business that's holding them back from moving at the speed necessary to, I guess, break away from running the business and keeping the lights on, saying regulated, to being in a very competitive, um, agile, digitally enabled space. Yeah. Richard, we often hear about the next generation in the digital world, next generation Wi-Fi, next generation operating. What does next generation actually mean for the financial services industry? Look, um, maybe I'll position it this way. A lot of people know about the idea of uh, buy versus build and, and um, you know, th this is a classic decision that a financial services IT organisation has to make. Is there something off the shelf or do I build it myself? And they realise that that building um, is the way to get differentiation, but there's often a lot of costs associated with it. Um, so a lot of them are turning to platforms, but platforms are typically things that these organisations look to build themselves, often throwing huge numbers of resources uh, and, and using a whole bunch of open source software to, to construct these as well as leveraging things like cloud services. So from our perspective at OutSystems, the next generation is really looking to provide an out of the box platform that a customer doesn't have to go and spend a massive amount of money on themselves to build and to maintain, which will then let them provide the sort of differentiation that will let them get ahead in the marketplace. Now, Richard, we at the front end or, or the consumers don't really notice a lot of this. Is there a competitive advantage for adopting this, this new generation? Yeah, look, um, you, you end up seeing the, the sort of the front end effects on you in, in a number of areas. One is sometimes there's, there's actual um, customer facing digital capabilities, things like you know, the mobile apps, and the banking portals that you're, you're used to interacting with, for instance, with a financial services company, sometimes that's the area of improvement. Um, some of the other improvements are more in the back office and you see those sorts of tangible improvements in things like um, loan processing times, um, which are often you know, taken up by a lot of compliance activities, which aren't directly visible to, to the customer 
but which create a big drag on, on the bank's efficiencies. And then you'll also see it hopefully in uh, things like increased interest rates when banks can reduce their, their costs, which are, which are absolutely massive to, to maintain the IT systems that they have. Great. Now, Pete, last time you spoke to us about the spectrum of low-code technology platforms, and now I'm hearing about app systems. Where does this yep. fit into in this spectrum? Yeah, so uh, I guess just to recap on that, if we look at low-code, which is a, a widely used term now, this is the next generation where spend is going and where development is going for organisations. There, there was a spectrum of different um, types of low-code platforms. So we've got business process management platforms, which are all about workflow, uh, domain-centric platforms such as, uh, take Salesforce an example, a CRM, which has its own low-code development environment, but within that domain. But then we get to the, the I guess, the top end of that spectrum, which is what we refer to as pro-code, which is where our system sits. And, and this is a direct competitor to traditional development where um, you can build anything that you need for a, a business from portals to mobile apps to business process solutions, integrate with your existing systems, great integration points, all the things you need to do in one convenient place. And it, it's, and this is one of those things I think for people watching this segment to understand is that there is this spectrum and you might have some of these platforms in your, your network or in your env environment, but if you really want to take cost out of the development of bespoke solutions, you need to look at something like an OutSystems, which provides you the capability to deliver end-to-end. -end. Well, Pete, these OutSystems platforms sound great, but are they already being used across the financial service industry? And if so, can you tell us about some of the success stories? Yeah, there's certainly been, and I'll, I'll refer to Richard as well on this one, but they're certainly being used uh, across the board, both within Australia, across Asia and globally, uh, banks, insurance companies, well, across the spectrum. We have a number of customers ranging uh, across those industries. Uh, one that springs to mind is a, a large life insurer we're working in who have really standardised on this approach globally because, A, they couldn't find the people that they needed. B, they were going through a pathway of acquiring lots of other businesses and needing to move with speed to integrate those businesses into their broader organisation framework and having very bespoke requirements around that. So it was really a question of what's the cost equation of buy before build versus build before buy and what they standardised on that systems because they could move faster and build stuff cheaper by using out systems than if they bought a product off the shelf and configured it and then they get what they want. In fact, uh, just to give uh, the viewers a, an idea, we were able to build an entire policy administration system, which is a complex back-end system, within three months with this type of approach. That's a real game-changing uh, approach, which is really taking cost and time out of uh, uh, these sorts of initiatives, which are integral to a business like that. Uh, and so that's an Australian-based example. Uh, Richie, do you want to talk to some others? Yeah, look, um, there's a really uh, interesting example in the Philippines, which is uh, Union Bank. So Union Bank became a customer of ours in 2018, not too long ago. They've already, uh, when, when we did a, a bit of a checkpoint with them six months ago, they'd built 67 new applications, of which 25 are, are key business critical apps. They range from um, their, their, their core retail mobile app and an in-branch robot they've built with this really cool iPad app behind it, a whole bunch of employee-facing portals, um, back-end processing such as AML screening. Um, they've been able to derive um, increased efficiency through a new document management system. And they've also been expanding into specialised banking areas like being able to do check deposits just by, by scanning a photo of the check. Now, in terms of tangible benefits, what they've been able to achieve between 2018 and 2020 is not only has their net revenue gone up 28%, but at the same time, their cost of income is down 22%. And if you look at bankquality.com, in the last uh, year from 2020 to 2021, they've gone from 25th to first place in terms of net promoter score. So they've really uh, been able to achieve the trifecta of what you know, banks are even struggling to achieve one of, which is increasing their revenue um, also increasing their income 
and, and increasing their customer satisfaction. And a lot of these they put down to their, their strategic shift to using um, the OutSystems platform. Oh, well, it's really pertinent at the moment with insurance companies at the forefront giving the uh, horrific floods that we're seeing up, up in our uh, northern end of Queensland and uh, New South Wales. Banks are often in the picture as well, and we hear about them spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this. Those savings that you've just mentioned, is that because you've managed to simplify the complexity and reduce their spend? Um, so there's, there's a number of different areas that um, it comes from. One that I'd really like to call out is there's, there's a definitely an increase in, in developer productivity. But what a lot of people, I guess, don't realise around the sort of you know, mature low code platforms that are enterprise ready like out systems is there's also a significant reduction in, in BAU resourcing and costs. So you don't need teams to be setting up and configuring and maintaining complex cloud configurations, all of the different um, services that organizations will typically use in AWS or Azure require a massive team typically to, to configure and maintain. So there are cost savings at that end as well around the whole application lifecycle, as well as productivity increases around development. And all of these pay sort of a dividend in, in terms of being able to innovate faster, as well as saving costs. And that helps these, these, these organizers not only differentiate, but in the case of things like the floods that you mentioned, and, and obviously when the pandemic started, there's a, there's a need for organizations to move faster, to adapt to changing conditions, you know, with all of these this chaos that we're seeing in the world at the moment, all organisations need to be able to, to move more rapidly. And that's what we're seeing our, our customers being able to do with, with these new capabilities. Well, oh, Richard, that, yeah. that, oh, sorry, Pete, go on. I was just going to jump in there, just on your point about the insurers. Uh, and imagine what it means to the customers of that insurer if they can now get a solution related to the floods and helping those customers who've been affected out in days to weeks rather than waiting weeks to months to get a solution to put. And, and that's part of the speed equation. We, we've had solutions go from zero to complete into production used by customers within, I think the shortest was four days. And it's in a large financial institution of compliance requirements and testing and having to get everything approved and ticked up. This is the sort of game-changing agility that can be unlocked with this type of approach. Well, Richard, you've sort of answered one of my next questions here because ironically getting digital done right used to require or seemed to require lots of people and it's often announced that financial services organisations see themselves as technology companies and often set out to build their own platforms at great expense on which to deliver those very solutions. Do they actually still need to do that given what you've told us now? Look, look I think... Yeah, as I mentioned right up front, that's been the traditional approach of, of these organisations. Um, and, and also maybe when they've looked even in the low code space, they've looked at sort of the, the more well-known um, players in this space. Pete mentioned a couple like Salesforce and Microsoft, and they've got capability in that area, absolutely. But usually it's not enough for, say, a banker or an insurer to go, right, I can really change strategically how I am approaching my development. It, it, they, they just don't have the breadth of capability in there. And, and part of what's important when you're looking at a, at a platform is to understand what is going to be the resource impact. So as, as I mentioned, I think that a mature enterprise low-code platform like OutSystems really gives organisations the ability to, 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 to change their strategy on how they do custom build, which is always going to be a key component. And the savings are, are going to be around the sorts of resources. Now, the, the, other, the other point is we know that you know, th these savings won't necessarily even mean cutting staff. It's just retasking the, the staff within the organisation to work on a platform that's going to be vastly more productive so that they can attack their backlog better, better than they currently are. So that's what we're starting to see in the market. The, the, the financial service industry is waking up to the fact that there is a better way of doing things and we, we better jump on, otherwise we're going to get left behind. Mm. Now, Pete, we also know that with change, there also comes pain. I know that my 10-year-old daughter is now my IT manager as far as the password goes when we upgraded our modem. 
So it's going to the next generation of technology. It obviously has its own set of challenges. And what does this change mean for actual organisations and developers and their customers? Yeah, yeah, we are creatures of habit, aren't we? And we, we do like to be in that, that status quo. And, it, and you, you can't innovate without pain. You can't change without pain. Preferably, you're changing before the pain gets too much that so you're forced to change. But look, for, for organisations, there's, there's lots of commitment to strategies. There's lots of people that have been hired. Richard's just spoken about the hundreds of people that are often brought in to build these frameworks and uh, stand up the technology and then these people are re refreshing and replacing that technology every three years to keep things current but it's a sort of endless battle of keeping things current and it's the the, the change here is a bit of a mindset it's going from doing what they're currently doing around maintaining that framework and how the organization operates to switching around to thinking about outcomes and what what they can do for the business how much more value can they deliver if they can move faster? And what else can they do if they can move faster? And it takes a bit of a, a step of belief. It, it takes a bit of faith in there because this is new for everyone. And where we're finding success is with the organisations who can say, here's a, a small area where we can start and we can prove it out. It's actually going to deliver value demonstrate that value and then play it back in the organisation. And we, we went through this uh, it was about seven years ago now when we changed our development teams across from the people who defined themselves by the technology frameworks they knew so that they could look on LinkedIn and find jobs to now they, they are developers who um, think about how much revenue they're helping an organisation to bring in, how much they're uplifting customer experience. If it's not for profit, how much they're bringing a valuable service uh, to people. If it's the government, like the NDI, how they're helping better uh, people with disabilities better spend money um, using the solutions they've built to get the services they need. And it's much more rewarding, but it does take a mindset shift and it takes support from the top and across the organisation to really reinforce the culture and the belief required to make this part of path forward. All right, Richard, so if I was the chief information officer of a bank and not you know, a second rate host on a first rate uh, news organisation or of an insurance company, what recommendations would you have for me to take advantage of this new generation of, of technology? Okay, so first of all, um, I'd really recommend having a good look across the board at what's available. As, as Pete mentioned early on, there's a lot of um, technologies out there that have got the low code stamp on them. They have very different heritages and very different sweet spots and sets of capabilities. Um, and, and for something like a large bank, there's really only some of them that are, that are suitable across the board. There are lots of analyst reports say that, that will help you know, these sort of thought leaders understand what the differences are. And secondly, uh, to, to Pete's point, um, I would also recommend starting with whatever a particular pain within the organisation is. Obviously, you're not going to go wall to wall changing how things work on day one, but there are you know, plenty of fires that we see in financial services organisations that need to be addressed. Um, so it's sort of a bit of like the, 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 the think local uh, you know, or act local, think global kind of message. You know, think about what you can fix now but look at what the strategic um, advantages you can bring to your organisation by, by shifting more broadly how your, how your custom development is, is done and consider those. So those would be my two key messages. Look at what's available now, look at it in detail because there is a lot of differences and look at it strategically how it can have an impact on your organisation. All right, Richard and Peter from DB Results, thanks so much for the insights. No, Thank you very much.